Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the kickoff event of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies online series on decolonizing Europe. My name is Beste Schleyen. I am the co-convener of this online series together with my colleague Tasnim Anwar. We are both from the Political Science Department of the University of Amsterdam. We are extremely happy and honored to start our series with two distinguished uh, uh, scholars, Professor Gurminder Bambra and Dr. Darshan Vigneshwaran. And I'm also extremely happy to see such a big interest in our kickoff event, which actually shows how impor important and timely these debates are. Before I introduce our speakers and today's session, I want to briefly explain the idea uh, for this series. So the idea has been developed over a long uh, period of personal discussions, encounters in the classroom and debates at our institution, as well as other uh, academic and public spaces. And with this series, we aim to provide a platform to discuss and debate how colonialism and race have impacted on our understanding of Europe and Europe's place in the world. So we already have five events confirmed before the summer break, and we will continue after the summer. So please check the website of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies uh, to register for the events. And you can also follow us on Twitter, the Twitter account of Amsterdam Center for European Studies. And you can also subscribe uh, to our newsletter. So today's topic is Centering Europe, how to rethink Europe's place in the world and in academia. So we have uh, two distinguished uh, speakers. Thank you for being with us. Uh, so Gurminder Bambra uh, is our first speaker, who is a professor of postcolonial and decolonial studies in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex. Her research interests are primarily in the intersection of postcolonial and global historical sociology. She is also interested in the intersection of the social sciences more generally, with recent interest in postcolonial and decolonial studies. And her current project is on epistemological justice and reparations. And our second uh, panelist is Dr. Darshan Vigneshwaran, who is an associate professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. Darshan's research lies at the intersection of international relations and political uh, geography. Darshan aims to understand and explain uh, deep changes in the structure of international politics and his work is primarily interested in territoriality, changing patterns of human mobility and settlement. Uh, so a few words about today's topic. Our main question in this, uh, in this session is, what is Eurocentrism? We will discuss the origins and implications of Eurocentric views for our understanding of international politics, particularly Europe and Europe's place in the world. We will also debate possible avenues of thinking differently and explore what it entails to do research from a non-Eurocentric perspective. So this is a one hour event. We will devote the next 35 minutes to a conversation between our two speakers moderated through topics. This will be followed by a, by a Q&A for 15 minutes. Then uh, we will uh, conclude with the final remarks of our speakers. So this session is being recorded after editing done by our management. Uh, we will upload the video tomorrow through the YouTube channel of the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research. So I want to start the conversation with a broad question. Um, so what is a decolonizing research agenda in the study of Europe? And relatedly, how do decolonial thought and postcolonialism relate to one another? Germinder, do you want to start? Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this series as well. I guess I would like to start by thinking about the ways in which both post-colonial theory and decolonial theory provoke questions of how colonialism configures our contemporary world. I use the term post-colonial not as a way of thinking about the world after colonialism, but rather as a theoretical provocation to think about colonialism in every discussion that we have about the world within which we are. Just to say a little bit about the post-colonial and the decolonial, I mean, both of them, well, 
post-colonial theory emerges within the humanities specifically. It's often associated with the work of people like Edward Said, Gaitri Spivak, Homi Baba, and its focus is very much in relation to North Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. Decoloniality emerges a little bit later. It emerges through the work of people like Maria Lugones, Annabel Quijano, Walter Mignolo, and it's interested in thinking about the configuration of the world from the travels of Columbus onwards, and its focus is much more in relation to those territories that we come to know as the Americas. And what I find interesting with both, both post-colonial and decolonial theory is that the lens is very much on where Europe goes to. And I guess partly what I've tried to do within my work is to use the theoretical perspectives of both these uh, traditions of thought to try and think about Europe itself. So what would it mean to think of Europe as post-colonial? What does it mean, as you present in your title, to decolonize Europe? And so I'm sure this is stuff that we can unpack over the course of the hour. So maybe I should stop there and we can pick up some of those themes. Yeah, so if I could ju jump in, yeah, I, I think, but I mean, first of all, thank you and to the organizers for such a, a timely panel, right? I mean, I think even in the, in the course of having been invited for this, we've moved from decolonizing the discipline and decolonizing our curriculum to now we're to curriculum and now we're we're um we're decolonizing everything right it's it's really um feeding into to political um, activism and and to this political moment in a really profound way i mean for me i have a fairly i think much more narrow uh way of using uh, post-colonialism and decolonization in my work and and also the concept of eurocentrism i'm really interested in, particularly in the discipline of international relations and the study of the politics of migration. And there I'm interested in, in the, this idea we, that, that Europe is somehow the crucible historically and also in terms of the way in which we think about the politics of migration and the origins of the state right? and, and the origins of international relations. And, and in that respect, I mean, one of the things that I've been looking for and trying to understand is that 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 notion doesn't always originate in clearly formulated work or clearly formulated claims about the past and about history, but often appears in a series of, of silences, of lazy methods of what, I mean, I think in, in um, Professor Bumbra's work, she, she, on Brexit, she isolates this sort of, you know, methodological whiteness, which appears as a, as a sort of a, a slackness or an, a lack of attention to detail because I think for me in my work whenever I whenever I've encountered Eurocentrism it's always been something that with a little with a tiny bit of scratching below the surface is something that um, that crumbles really quickly with just a little bit of archival work and, and looking towards the past of the historical record and so that's that's the, the sort of um, yeah the the way in which I define and think about those terms. Uh, maybe a more specific question. Um, both of you have addressed the historical aspects of uh, Eurocentrism in your scholarly work. Um, Germinder has extensively engaged with uh, historical sociology, uh, whereas you, Darshan, um, you have drawn our atten attention to Eurocentric historiography. A common theme in your engagement with the historical aspects of Eurocentrism is modernity. So my question is, how does the study of modernity enable, uh, enable us to rethink the history of Europe and Europe's place in the world? Yeah, sure. That's a tough question, <laughs> but I'll, I'll do my best to deal with it. I mean, I'm really interested in, um, in particular, I mean, like the, the, the recent article on in international political sociology in, um, you know, IR loves, uh, international relations loves its epochs. Like it likes periods, it likes defined, and, and contained um, historical moments that it can refer to. And there's a series of these, 1648 Westphalia is its favorite, right? As its, its benchmark or its, its bookend for modernity. And to a certain extent, I think all sort of disciplines that are focused really on the contemporary moment have these weaknesses, right? We, we can't all be historians, right? We, we can't all have a deep and rich knowledge about the past. And so, in everyday discussion within academic journals and with, within academic conversation within IR, 
we have these sort of labels that we use to 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 ease our mind about the complexity about of history and so in in the work that i've done on it, it, it is to try and look at the eurocentric nature of periodization about the state and also in particular about um, what i'm calling the the modern migration regime right and and the notion that i try to tease away at is this idea that all of these practices in some way originated in pristine form in in europe and then were extended to the rest of the world which is something that gaminda has has really um, uh, looked at critically in in her work and all i try to do in in my work is to try to question that and to see you know where did these practices originate from and and where did they come from and with a little bit of archival research you know that the myths of this nice linear narrative stretching from westphalia to the present fall apart relatively quickly and the importance of of actors in what we may call the colonial world or the global south um, comes up really quickly the moment you begin to conduct archival research and so what I've been trying to do is to say, look, if we do need stories about the past, we can po probably tell some better ones, right? And then there are ones that, that rely and, and, and talk about, and we're going to get to this, um, I think, over the, the course of the hour, that rely on discussing the connections between Europe and its outside, and how Europe also was in many ways um, the product of, of forces emanating from outside of its geographical boundaries. I mean, I guess just to pick up on some of that, because the um, work that I've done around thinking about modernity has been that when I first encountered the concept, it was in the context of thinking about other things that I kept coming across the term modernity in my research. And I thought, well, it would be useful to have a sense of what modernity actually is. So I did a lot of reading and it was interesting because sociologists, whether they were Marxists or barbarians or postmodernists or coming from whatever part of that spectrum, they were all they all had different views on modernity except there were two things that they all agreed on and the two things that they all agreed on was that modernity was marked by a break in time so a break from a pre-modern agrarian past into a modern industrial present and that that temporal break was located geographically spatially within europe or you might extend it to north america as well and that this somehow marked off modern europe as distinct from the rest of the world so modernity is very much associated with the idea of modern Europe and modern Europe is based on an understanding of particular histories, specifically those of what gets to be called the Industrial Revolution and then the French and American Revolution. So you have the economic and political uh, dimensions to this. Now, in the course of the work that I did around this, partly because of having a, a background in history, it wasn't so much the need to do archival research, but just to read history more broadly than was being presented within the accounts that were being used by social scientists. And what became clear to me quite quickly was the fact that historians are much less um, committed to ideas of rupture and difference than they are to thinking about connections across time and across place. And so with both the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, whilst there are histories that talk about the endogenous origins of these events, from the research that I did, there was much to suggest that these events were not endogenous or internal to Europe, but were actually uh, part constituted through the global conditions that made them possible. If I can just give one example of this in order to um, illustrate the, 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 the account. When we think of the French Revolution, one of the most radical documents of the French Revolution is the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. And that's taken as the basis of our contemporary human rights documents and, and so on. And there's often a debate around, well, human rights are Western, therefore they're not universal, or even if human rights are Western, nonetheless, they're universal. But the idea that human rights emerge out of a Western trajectory is never something that's put at issue in, in any fundamental way. Now, if we take the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, I would assert that the most radical uh, statement within that declaration is the statement for the abolition of slavery. Now, the only reason that that statement is there in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen is because formerly enslaved people who had emancipated themselves through the process of the Haitian Revolution traveled across the Atlantic 
to France, to Paris, to the Constituent Assembly to argue for the abolition of slavery, something that they had already enacted in Saint-Domingue, which was the name of Haiti prior to the revolution. And now they traveled across in order for France to abolish slavery across its, its colonial empire. And in 1794, they agreed to do that. So the Constituent Assembly passed a motion to abolish slavery across the colonies and, and the empire. And this gets reversed by Napoleon in 1802, but nonetheless, that radical notion is something that is brought from Haiti and inserted into what gets presented as a Western genealogy. So if we're talking about undoing Eurocentrism, one of the things that we also need to be aware of is that Eurocentrism also rests in the assumption that things are European, when actually they have a much broader provenance. Thank you, Gurminder. Dasha wants to follow up on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I have the same feeling, right, in that, like, a lot of my work is based on, uh, you know, trails blazed uh, and secondary source work building on historians and what they've already done. And historians who often look at international relations and go, are you guys crazy? Or like, you know, do you still believe in that sort of the, all of these myths? Um, because, they're, they're, you know, there's so much grounded work that they've done in archival research which the moment you sort of unpack and dig beyond your disciplinary understanding, you begin to see a different world, different worlds out there and the way in which modernity was constructed. I'm just wondering whether you have any insights on, you know, on the reasons behind those barriers and the, and, and the slow translation from, you know, what, where things are at in, in historical understanding and more contemporary focused disciplines like sociology, politics, international relations. I think one of the reasons for this disjunct is partly that within the social sciences, we're committed to a grand narrative. And the grand narrative, mm -hmm. however it's framed, always ends up being some version of stuff happens in Europe, then it travels to the rest of the world. People mm -hmm. may use more fancy language than that to describe it, but that's effectively <laughs> what is being argued. And what for me has been something that I've been trying to do and argue for across the work that I've done is to say that deconstruction is not sufficient. So there's been a lot of work deconstructing narratives of sort of criticizing the idea of the grand narrative and criticizing particular types of narratives. And I think that needs to be a second step and that's a reconstruction. Because if we mm. stop at the point of deconstruction, we allow the common sense grand narrative to continue and remain in place and it continues to structure everything that we do. So all deconstructive moments end up reproducing the status quo because they haven't been reconstructed into something else. So my position is not that I'm opposed to grand narratives. I think grand nar I don't think the social sciences can exist outside of grand narratives. The problem is that we haven't transformed our understandings of grand narratives sufficiently in order for an alternative grand narrative to provide the base from which we go on to think about uh, the work that we're doing. Thank you both. You have already covered some of the issues that I wanted to ask you with the next topic, uh, that is uh, the concept of connected histories. Maybe it's good to uh, remind us what the concept is about. And I want to also ask, ask Darshan how uh, he used this uh, Europe as the origin uh, concept uh, in his research on the emergence of the modern territoriality uh, norm. Uh, also the also the operation and origins of uh, migration uh, regimes yeah i mean i think um that thanks for that i think this can connect to the discussion before right because one of the questions i have back for gominda is like is if we're not against grand narrative um what do we replace the existing flawed narratives with and and my hunch has to been to go for because i believe that eurocentrism lies in like I'm going to really oversimplify in kind of a series of lazinesses, right? Like of, of, of trying to, you know, develop simplifying devices to understand um, the complex past. And I think in, in that respect, one of the things that I've gone for is to go, okay, we have these moments for in migration control. It's there's three moments and, and territoriality. It's the, the Westphalian moment, um, the interwar years moment where the, uh, the migration uh, management system is supposed to, can sort of come together 
and 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 those two moments sort of define this European lineage. And my my hunch was to go well. If we do need a moment, what should we look for, right? And I looked for a replacement moment, and and my my hunch and my stab at it was to say, you know, instead of 1920 or 1648, let's go for 1960 and the UN Declaration of um, uh, on de on decolonization, right? And and this was actually a key moment in which Europe's modern notion of who could come to Europe. Um, what borders were for was constituted, and at the same time, you see this, you know, this transformation of the international system with this massive decolonization occurring in in Africa um, and Asia in particular. But I don't know, I don't know whether that's satisfactory, right, for the type of connected history that I mean, Derminda is trying to produce, and which seems to be more subtle and um, more um, more difficult. Well, I guess one of the things that I'm seeking to do is this aspect that our brand narrative is structured around the idea of the emergence of the modern world. But as both post-colonial theorists and then more, perhaps more specifically, decolonial theorists have argued for the fact that there is no way in which we can understand the emergence of the modern without understanding how the modern was intimately connected with the colonial. You know, it's not that colonialism is something that occurs after modernity or through modernity, but that modernity itself is produced through colonization. And if we think about the ways in which particularly the, the, the scholars associated with the school of decoloniality have argued that the movement of Columbus and the idea, the invention of the Americas and the way in which Europeans come to uh, dispossess and appropriate land within the Americas, that that's the beginning of both the modern world, but it's a modern world that's constructed through processes of dispossession, enslavement, appropriation, elimination. And yet our understanding of the modern world is always in terms of the positive notions of political modernity or economic modernity associated mm -hmm. with democratic revolutions and the industrial revolution. Now, the two democratic revolutions that are understood as part of modernity are the French and the American. Both of these maintained slave societies through the, the, the centuries, they maintained segregation, and it wasn't until the 1960s that in the US that formal desegregation comes into being. And it's also not till the early 70s that France, uh, you know, you have the decolonization of Algeria and the, the breakup of the French Empire, although it sort of continues in different forms nonetheless. So if you have as your exemplars two revolutions that are presented as democratic and yet continue to be shaped by their constitution as both slave societies, empires and colonial societies through until the, the mid 20th century, then to me they're not great examples of what a democratic society is. If on the other hand we look at the example of the Haitian revolution, which I've mentioned briefly before, but when the people in Saint-Domingue, people who had formerly been enslaved, when they revolted and threw off both enslavement and colonization and created the new state of Haiti, there were two things that they did that to me would have to be the hallmarks of a democratic society. First is that they abolished slavery. So the first time in the modern world do you have a state abolishing slavery. And then secondly, they make color no bar to political participation. They say that anybody who is black is a citizen. But their understanding of black was not an epidemiological understanding. Mm. Their understanding of black was a political understanding because there were people in Haiti, Germans and Poles who had been taken there as indentured workers, who were also thought of as black because they existed in a condition of indenture stroke enslavement. And so in that sense, they associated the term black with an expansive notion of what it was to be human, that is to wish to not be enslaved or colonized. And so the question for me is partly within the social sciences, why is it that we develop our understandings of democracy on the histories of America and France without taking into account their colonial and segregationist histories and we completely elide Haiti from that same understanding. So it's not that we don't already have the histories of Haiti. CLR James has written the classic account, Michelle Roth Trio has written, and actually one of the first accounts that I've come across is by Anna Julia Cooper, 
who was an African-American woman who wrote her thesis at the Sorbonne on the relationship between the French and Haitian revolutions. And I think this was in 1926. So we have a long history of knowing about the Haitian revolution, but we don't take it seriously. So if you're asking the question to me about, well, what would constitute the grand narrative? I would say that we need to reconstruct a grand narrative that takes histories of colonization and enslavement seriously as the condition of the world within which we live. Our world is not the modern world. Our world is the colonial world. And it continues to be the colonial world because it's configured by practices which haven't yet been undone and resolved. So what would it mean if instead of picking those histories that confirm our understanding of the world being modern, we were to examine more seriously those histories that point to the colonial nature of the world within which we are and construct a narrative on the basis of those and use that as the basis for the work that we do. Thank you, Bon. It connects very well with the, the, the next uh, topic that I want to introduce, which is uh, about the epistemic aspect of Eurocentrism that both of you have also dealt with in your work. Um, so, Gormander, you have recently proposed the concept of uh, methodological whiteness, which uh, Darshan uh, also uh, uh, pointed to in the introductory, introductory speech. Uh, so you introduced this concept also by reference to recent events, uh, both in Europe and the United States. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about what you mean by methodological whiteness and what effects uh, this has for our academic practice? And a question to both of you, what other ep epistemic dimensions of Eurocentrism have you identified uh, in your uh, work? And what uh, concrete epistemic moves have you yourselves undertaken in order to uh, challenge some of the, uh, address some of the challenges relating to Eurocentrism? So with methodological whiteness, what I was wanting to point to was the failure of much social science to take seriously the experiences of people beyond the West in its construction of narratives about how we have come to be. So if we think about Europe, for example, one of the ways in which particularly the idea of the European project has come to be defined has been through the lens of cosmopolitanism. So we talk about cosmopolitan Europe, both as a way of addressing the differences between European countries, but also as a normative project that gives sort of life to the, the, the very idea of Europe. One of the difficulties with the idea of cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitan Europe in the way in which it's used is that because it only sees the histories of European nations as national histories, it can't account for the multicultural diversity that exists within Europe, except somehow as an imposition, as something that comes in from the outside at a later stage. So my argument is that European nations, for the most part, do not have histories that are only national histories. They have, they have been empires and as a consequence they have imperial histories. Even those countries within Europe that haven't, have for, haven't had formal empires have nonetheless participated in the European colonial project in a variety of ways. And so there is no way to tell the history of Europe as an aggregation of the national histories of the different states within Europe. To do so, is to reproduce an understanding of Europe as white that is deeply problematic because it's empirically incorrect. And so if it's empirically incorrect and yet we develop normative accounts on the basis of this idea, then what we're doing, I would argue, is this notion of methodological whiteness, which doesn't allow us to actually account for how and why Europe comes to look the way in which it does. And so it's not about uh, whiteness in the way that whiteness might be used within critical race theory or, or other aspects. It's really about this aspect of what are the methodological issues at stake in not taking seriously the multicultural histories that constitute Europe in its empirical diversity. And failing to take that seriously leads to claims and concerns about white replacement and other such sort of nativist uh, uh, understandings that, that are at play in Europe at the moment. 
Roshan? I'm gonna I'm gonna take the liberty of being a little bit of a fence sitter here on this question, and um, and that's to say that on on the one hand, there's part of me that believes in like as a true believer in social science and social science research methods, and in and in my colleagues' um, ability to see uh, post coloniality um, as a as a way of improving those methods, and I think that's where I mean, for, if we look at say Gominda's piece on methodological whiteness. It's a really interesting piece in that right it's it's post-colonial critique but done with you know analysis of descriptive analysis of statistics right and she basically says if you look at the stats you know uh, we have this group that voted for both trump and brexit right? and they have been labeled the the white working class right but one of those monikers or adjectives is doing more work than the others right the, the whiteness seems to matter more than than the working class when we look at this as a standard demographic voting block, right? Um, and and I follow the same sorts of lines in my work, right? And that I, I believe that, you know, at, on one level, that standard, uh, you know, social scientists, so social scientific beliefs in, in things like representativity, right? In that if we want a picture of the global migration regime, we should look where the migrants are, right? Or we should look where the, the powerful states in control, the, the states that are most powerful in controlling migration are, and a lot of them are not in Europe and North America, right? And so if we want a more global picture, that's how we should move. And I think you see sort of slow movements in that direction. But there's another side of me, and this is the fence sitting side, where, um, uh, which is much more morose and, um, and skeptical about the potential for change. And that's, I mean, if you read the work of Lauren Landa on the political economy of knowledge production on migration and migration politics, he describes this, you know, this entrenched and geographically structured system where knowledge is produced in North America and Europe by Europeans and, and North Americans. And there's a systematic exclusion of ideas that, that prevent that, that centricity that, that notion of Europe and North America as, as the fulcrum and mitigates against these sort of standard um, um, forms of methodological critique. Well, thank you to both. Um, so our Q&A has started. Um, please send us your questions. Uh, we already have four questions, so I will start uh, with one of them uh, by Sophia Laugru. Um, good afternoon, great discussion so far. I was wondering if uh, Garminder Bambra could further develop the idea she shared that social sciences cannot exist outside of grant narratives. And I was wondering how reconstruction rather than deconstruction can work in the examination of narratives produced in and by Europe about its colonial past. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks for the, the question. I mean, it's partly this idea that it's incredibly difficult to think about our history outside of a particular sort of narrative. And so that even when you look at historical accounts which have sought to underplay the notion of grand narratives such as micro histories or people's histories and so on they're focusing on the very specificities of what's happening but it's nonetheless structured within an idea of where those micro histories are located and so this is why i was sort of saying that you know, it's not as if we don't have histories of different events and different times and different places. One of the reasons we know about the Haitian Revolution is because historians have written about it, as well as knowledge about the revolution circulating amongst activist groups and others in terms of sort of reclaiming that history that needs to be brought into the academy in particular sorts of ways. And so what Reconstruction points to for me is this idea, so, before I use the example of the French Revolution, this time I'm going to use the example of the Industrial Revolution. When I've done talks on this and I've asked people, where does the Industrial Revolution begin? Invariably, people say Europe. If you ask them to define it further, they say Britain. And if you're like, be really specific, where does the Industrial Revolution begin? And I don't know, almost every single time people say the cotton mills of Manchester. You know, this is the heart of the Industrial Revolution. And then I say, well, let's just take that for a moment. The cotton mills of Manchester. Where does cotton come from? It comes from India, as does the technology of how to dye and weave it. 
It's grown in the southern states of the US by Africans who are taken there as part of the European trade in human beings. The raw material is brought to Manchester and it's turned into cloth. That cloth then gets sold around the world, but it has to be sold at the point of a gun because it's of inferior quality to the cotton that's produced in other places. And so the cotton mills of Manchester cannot exist except that there are global conditions for the emergence of the cotton mills of Manchester. And yet our standard narrative always is, oh, we have the Industrial Revolution in Europe and then things develop and go to the rest of the world. So I want to reconstruct that narrative to say that it was processes of colonization and enslavement that created the connections that brought our world into a global ambit. And that globality is what gives the possibility for the Industrial Revolution to emerge within Europe. And you might say, well, that's, you know, in a way, okay, fine, we'll give you that. What does it really matter whether we think about it as the Industrial Revolution happening in Europe going to the rest of the world or the rest of the world being part of the story? The reason it matters is because those connected histories or connected sociologies, as I call them, because I want to think about the way in which these things are not just simply historical, but also shape our present, is that when we talk about places being poor, we often say place X is poor. And then we say, if we're so motivated, oh, well, I can give some money to place X so it's not so poor. I can address poverty in other places through my benevolence or my charity because I feel bad. If we say place X is made poor as a consequence of the very same processes that made me rich, then my wealth here is intimately related to the poverty of others elsewhere. Then it's not just a question of benevolence or charity, it's a question of the just redistribution of resources. Now, I had nothing to do with where I am being wealthy. I wasn't alive then. But nonetheless, I live the consequences of the historical processes that have made Britain a wealthy country. So in that sense, it changes the way we think about politics in the present if we're to acknowledge the connections in the past and how those connections configure inequality and continue to reproduce that inequality in the present. And so that's why I would argue for reconstructing the narratives because through the processes of reconstruction, we open up different possibilities for politics in the present. Thank you, Gurminder. Um, so we have um, two questions by Christine Krause. First of all, uh, she thanks you for your teaching uh, and also for this event and your writing. Um, so one question is, um, so she argues uh, there is a danger that postcolonial and decolonial methods and thoughts. Um, sorry, when questions arrive, the screen changes. Yeah, there is a danger that postcolonial and decolonial methods and thoughts are only used to make Europe better. Point made by my colleague Adnan Hussein in many discussions. How to decolonize Europe beyond this is uh, one question. And the second question, um, it, it's about a uh, geographical area that I know you haven't worked with, but maybe you have some thoughts. Can we relate the concept of methodological whiteness to the inequalities in current post-Cold uh, War Europe itself, for instance, between post-socialist, post-Soviet and other er areas? Do you, do you want me to respond? I mean, yeah. I would say that uh, that for me, okay, so if I have a project of making Europe better, it's to be better in the sense of acting justly in relation to its past. So the issue is not to be better in its own terms, but to be better in terms of rectifying the wrongs, the historical wrongs that have been perpetrated. And that's why I have a focus very much on reparations. There is no way that the work that I'm interested in doing is separate from the materiality that would, or the material reparations that would also be needed. Um, you know, I mean, just, just yesterday, our Prime Minister here in Britain has decided to merge the Department for International Development with the Foreign Office. 
And one of the things that he said in the context of, of uh, making this decision was, we cannot have people in the rest of the world thinking that Britain is just a cash point in the sky from which they can get money. And I just thought, there is no understanding of the way in which the British Empire saw the empire as a cash point from which it just withdrew wealth and resources and so on to make what Britain is. I mean, Utsa Patnaik has written about the way in which she's, she's an economist based at JNU in Delhi. And by looking at the trade and other data for the, the 200 years of the British Empire, she calculated that Britain took more than $45 trillion from India over two centuries. This is just a staggering amount. And this was used then to develop Britain and is the, you know, the context also of the poverty and the immiseration of India, but also the rest of the colonies because Britain extracted wealth from the entire empire and not just wealth, but also taxes. So people paid taxes, which were then used for the build up of institutions in Britain. And when now they say, oh, well, you know, you can't access the welfare state in Britain because you're not uh, a British citizen. Well, if you're a subject of empire, then your ancestors will have paid taxes for the establishment of institutions in Britain. And so to recognize those sorts of links would, to my mind, make Europe better, but only if it took its responsibilities on board to make right the wrongs that have contributed to what it currently is. So my push is always for material reparations. In terms of methodological whiteness, I mean, I think there are ways in which this could be used in terms of thinking about inequalities within Europe itself. I would certainly have no wish to flatten the differences that exist amongst European countries. And when I talk about all Europeans being involved in the European colonial project, I do talk about it in terms of the varieties of colonialism that constitute this. So you had formal empires, but you also had uh, Europeans involved in what I call, you know, in, in the movements from Europe to the Americas to be part of the settler colonial project in America. And that involved people from Eastern Europe, from the Scandinavian countries, as well as Central Europe and, and so on. And so I think there is something whereby we can talk about a common European colonial project, but then also to be mindful of the inequalities and differences that exist within Europe, particularly as they play out post the social, the, the socialist divide that occurs in, in, in fracturing that sense of a European identity. Darshan, do you want to answer? I can just look very briefly on, I mean, you know, I don't have anything to say in detail and that's going to be very informative on Eastern Europe and post uh, Cold War issues there. But I mean, in terms of making Europe better, um, I think that Eurocentrism in our knowledge um, plays a major role in our, in our misunderstanding and our failure to address contemporary processes of migration in, in Europe and from out, the outside of Europe to Europe. And why I say that is I'm currently working on a project which looks at the European Union Trust Fund for Africa and, and Europe's attempts to um, intervene in particularly the northern parts of the continent in order to basically build from the ground up a migration regime that looks something like Europeans understand the sorts of border controls, the detention and deportation systems that, that Europeans are familiar with and that they've utilised on their own continent without recognizing that there are a series of very complex, first of all, movements within Africa. Most Africans do not move to Europe. They, they stay and move within African countries and between African countries. Um, and secondly, that there are complex political processes for the regulation of migration that might not look like the sort of pristine state that we have or we, we envisage as operating in a European context but are nonetheless powerful and deeply impact upon the way in which society and economies are organized. And, it, and it's a very sort of narrow Eurocentric ideas about how migration and mobility and the control of that works that are currently limiting our ability to, to manage it and, and to intervene in these sorts of Euro, Europe's ability to intervene in these situations and in these contexts in a meaningful um, and non-damaging way. 
Thank you. There was indeed a question by uh, Rana Joshkun about uh, decolonization and migration studies. So, you, Darshan, you have already answered uh, this question. Thanks for that. Um, so, a uh, question by Zahda. Uh, my questions go to both speakers. How do you handle reactions to your substantiated arguments on Eurocentrism in social sciences in the universities and in the places where you work? Um, where methodological whiteness is widespread, and how far have you managed to reconstruct the grand narratives in what's being taught in the universities? Sure. Okay. Um, well, these things take time, so it's not as if the the project, as I identify it, is one of a system of knowledge production which has been in place since at least 500 years. It's not going to be undone and transformed in 70 years. And so in that sense, the work that we're doing is contributing to this broader process of decolonization. And I noticed in the um, chat, so a couple of people had mentioned that the decolonization is not a metaphor article by Tuck and Wang. And I think that's a brilliant article and absolutely, I mean, in that sense, I don't think that disciplines can or need to be decolonized. I think they can be made better, but to make something better is not to decolonize it. And that we should be wary of the way in which this language gets reproduced and proliferated. Um, and I, I have to admit, I co-edited a volume called Decolonizing the University, but when I said to the publisher, I wanted to call it, how can we make the university a bit better? They, they just didn't allow that title to, to go ahead. So, you know, I mean, these things have a purchase and, and I absolutely uh, understand that. The issue around how we deal with it within universities, when I first started, when I started my first job, I was asked to teach a module, it was called Modernity and Globalization. I had just written and published this, the book, Rethinking Modernity, in which everything I argued in the book was repudiated in this module I was being asked to teach. And I thought, I can't teach this module, I've just written a book which contradicts everything within it. And so what do I do? You know, first job, first year, a month to prepare before teaching starts. And so I thought, okay, well, for the first half, I'll just teach the standard narrative. And then in the second half, I'll teach the critique. That was fine. The students were happy. Every essay that I got from my students were, modernity is a European phenomenon, even though the whole second half had been to critique that idea. So the next year I thought, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll teach the French Revolution, then I'll teach the Haitian Revolution. I'll teach the Industrial Revolution, then I'll teach colonization. I'll pair the topics. And again, it worked well. The students understood the critique. And again, every single essay at the end was modernity as European invention. And the thing that came clear to me is that no matter what we do in our teaching, students are also getting their information from the media, from TV, from films, from just generally being in society where what they're told is that modernity is something that Europe produces. And so then, you know, a couple of years on and I'm still trying to figure out how to sort the course out. And I decided to do a fundamental rewrite of it. And I just thought, you know, what if we started from the position of critique being the norm? Let's forget this idea of having to teach the standard account and then the critique. If I have faith in the critique, and I believe that the critique is how it ought to be, then why not just start with that? So I rewrote the module as race and the making of the modern world. We started with dispossession, elimination, appropriation, and we went from there. And the essays were just extraordinary because it was like the ground had been cleared for students to be able to start in a different place and to begin to make sense of this in relation to the new resources, the new ideas and the new work that they were being asked to read. And so it takes time. It took the fact that I was a permanent employee. I had uh, summers within which I could work on revising my course documents. If you're precariously employed and you've constantly got to sort of think up new modules, it's not something that's easy to do. And this was the fundamental basis of my research. I was able to use my research directly to inform the teaching that I wished to do. So it takes time and we can build on the work that each of us are doing in relation to this. It's never gonna be done by one person. This can only ever be a collaborative and collective project. 
where we work together and seek to reshape the courses we teach, how we communicate this stuff. And slowly, I think, um, change will come. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I think from, from my angle, I think like the way in which I've tended to con confront these problems in, in my own, you know, I guess, university and academic setting. I mean, one of the most powerful things that academics can do is to display a sort of a benign indifference for ideas right and that is that is often the way in which work from outside of a european context is is greeted right with oh yeah you do that interesting stuff over there in those strange places but like you know but like this is what this is where things really happen and what we're interested in talking about and that's something that's been going on particularly in the field of migration studies for a long time right and it's it's hard to penetrate and it requires repeated work i mean you're talking about doing it with your students but i think it also works among scholars as well, these sorts of dynamics. Um, where I have faith and, and the sort of model that I'm following is a, a transition in conflict, uh, the study of war that took place. And I'm, I owe this point to Ursula Duxica, a colleague of mine who makes this. And she says, well, you know, there was a point in which the, in the study of war, everyone was focused on this thing called interstate war amongst great powers, right, in international relations. And this was the, the, the thing that if you were a real IR scholar, you had to do. And that left all of these important and, you know, much more bloody conflicts in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, off the landscape when you were talking about really um, the, the type of you know, the study of war. And a lot of the scholars in this field eventually just started stacking up the numbers and saying, well, if we're interested in war, we're interested in death. And where do most people die and in what sorts of conflicts? And and in a, it didn't happen overnight, but over a period of 20 years, that field has radically changed to now the study of war is about, I mean, it's not decolonized in any way, but it's at least reflecting the experience and the nature of war in a fundamentally different way. And that's, that's my model for migration studies as to where it could, could end up. And, and I see, you see small changes in that direction, which, um, which give me some hope for, for change. Thank you both. Uh, I want to ask one last question uh, to both of you by uh, Nora Fischer Onar. Um, as a Europe trained US based, based scholar who has long admired the speakers' work, I wonder if you could untangle the purchase of post and decolonialism for the thought and activism of African Americans. What might be the purchase and perils of reading the US through a post colonial lens? Did you want to go push that? Okay. Um, well, I think, I mean, one of the things that I think it's interesting to think about in terms of the US is to think about the way in which it is a settler colonial state and how very rarely do we find within the social scientific literature uh, examination of the United States from the perspective of settler colonialism. It's often done in terms of or more usually done in terms of the Tocquevillian idea of, you know, democracy in America, it's the first new nation, it's distinct from France, because France, even though it has the revolution, nonetheless has to deal with its feudal legacy. Whereas in the US, US democracy was created de novo, it created the people as it created itself. And this idea that somehow that particular idea of what the US is, has such a hold within the social sciences is quite extraordinary given that it's often based in Tocqueville's work, his Democracy in America, and Tocqueville's book has a chapter within it on the three races. And Tocqueville says that you cannot understand anything that I have to say about democracy in America if you don't understand it in the context of this chapter on the three races. But in many texts of democracy in America that are made available in abridged form, that's the chapter that's excluded. And so if we're thinking about silences and erasures within the social sciences, one of the things that we have to think about is how even within canonical thinkers like Tocqueville, you have an excision of work that he does that challenges the way in which people have understood what it is that he himself has said. Now, I know the speaker is asking about this, uh, the, the purchase of post-colonial and decolonial in relation to Du Bois and Baldwin and others, but I just wanted to mention that aspect of Tocqueville to say that even canonical thinkers within the canon are subject to those processes of erasure 
and omission, which also sort of exclude others. If we think about Du Bois, and we think about the work that he does, you know, his first uh, main book, The Philadelphia Negro, it's published in 1895, almost 20 years before The Polish Peasant. The Polish Peasant is seen to be the first book that uh, establishes sociological thought within the US. It's, you know, it's, it's the, the, the classic text that, that's gone to. But The Philadelphia Negro was published before that book and it does almost exactly the same stuff in the sense that it's a, it's a piece of qualitative research where Du Bois has gone out with his team of investigators to look at uh, people's housing patterns and other things within Philadelphia to build up a picture of issues of inequality and so on within, uh, with, within Philadelphia. Now there's an issue around why Du Bois gets excluded from the history of sociology in the US and this occurs even among scholars, you know, there are sociologists and social scientists who've written essays on Du Bois talking about how wonderful Du Bois is. And at the same time, when they write the history of sociology in the US, Du Bois doesn't figure. So it's not that they don't know about Du Bois because they've written separately on him, but in their institutional account of the discipline, he doesn't exist as a figure. And so going back to the question of reconstruction and deconstruction, deconstruction is to acknowledge that Du Bois is great and his work is great. Reconstruction would be to rethink the discipline of sociology on the basis of Du Bois being fundamental to it, not as an add-on that we discover in the 60s or something and then think, oh, this was amazing. Du Bois was fundamental to the discipline from the late 19th century onwards. And so in that sense, I think if we accept that what post-colonial and decolonial thought is about is that provocation to think of colonialism as the condition of where we are, then what were the colonial processes at work that, ex that both were the conditions within which Du Bois was working and have also been the conditions of his exclusion? How can we locate the experience of the settler colony that addresses the dispossession and elimination of indigenous peoples and understand that as the foundational moment of the making of America and of the Americas because all of the Americas are a consequence of European settler colonialism. Thank you. Darshan, do you want to react? Yeah. I don't think I've got uh, much that is going to be that profound to add on to what um, the Pro Professor Barmer has said, but I would just say this and that like in recently many of you or many of the audience members would have been paying attention to this controversy over the over racism within international relations and particularly within securitization theory and um, there's many dimensions to this controversy, um, but during that conversation, a colleague of mine, because um, a lot of it was about, a lot of the discussion was about the use of the canon, and um, and who has contributed in what way to both racist thought and anti-racist thought. And my colleague, in a really offhand manner, said, um, "You know what? A lot of these conversations don't recognise is that rich white men are, are, are one of the main reasons for the end of slavery, and their ideas for the end of slavery and the end of racism." And that was an odd intervention, right? And 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 I and I was struck by the way in which the offhand nature in with which a comment like that could still be delivered in a way that that does precisely what Professor Barbara was talking about: this quick and sudden active erasure of a, of an entire intellectual um, lineage. Uh, and I and I I don't know whether. Uh, what to do about this, but I, I, I'm wondering about the amount of hard work that's required in solutions that, that the professor offers to to these types of, of, of problems and these types of dynamics, because it, it takes so much work to to do what is undone in, in seemingly just a minute. Thank you, Darshan. We have reached the end of our session, but I would like to give the floor to you once again uh, for, for your final remarks and maybe some questions for us to think uh, through and after this lecture. Gurminder? Um, well, I'd like to leave you with the words or with the discussion of the Booker Prize winning novelist Bernadine Evaristo. 
her, uh, one of her earlier books is called Soul Tourists. And in this novel, what she does is utilize the trope of ghosting or haunting to insist upon the presence of black people within Europe. And it's a novel based on a couple, uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean couple from London going and taking a car and traveling around Europe. And as they travel around Europe, they encounter ghosts of black Europeans. So people like Alexandra Dumas and Beethoven and others who are, who are, uh, are, are black Europeans, but are forgotten as black Europeans. And the couple keep encountering these ghosts and they sort of say, you know, well, why, why are you still haunting? Why aren't you just dead and, you know, gone? And they say, well, nobody remembers that we exist. We want you to make of us a memory once more. And so in a sense, what would it mean to remember those histories of Europe beyond the national histories, those histories of Europe that are multicultural in their historical context, not just in their contemporary context. And how would recovering those histories actually not do, just do justice to the people who had been here before, but also help us make sense of how we're configured in the present? Yeah, if I, if I could close on one note, and that is, I mean, the, the, the notion of a form of post-colonial research that I've been advocating for is one that is really grounded in very traditional social scientific research methods, right? And, and trying to use that as a way of coming to um, a picture of what I'm looking at in terms of this, this thing that I'm calling the global migration regime. And one of the difficulties in conducting and trying, I mean, if you follow a post-colonial method and you try to attribute agency to non-Europeans, to people outside of Europe, to non-white populations, then um, that can often lead you uh, down some troubling and difficult roads and, and questions in which non-white peoples are not always the victims or the oppressed, right? And in which you can reveal stories. I mean, a lot of my work at the moment is looking at um, contemporary and historical accounts of Myanmar and, and the types of uh, racism amongst two types of oppressed people and two types of the, but the people who have been colonized and those who are subject to post-colonial forms of oppression. And I think that, that that's where I think this agenda comes into some sort of troubling and difficult territory and that we have to be prepared that we're not always going to produce the stories and the narratives that, that neatly cohere with our contemporary and current um, ethical preferences or political preferences. And that I think is, is kind of one of the challenges and also the wonders of, of really bringing post-colonial research into our historical and political research. Thank you, Darshan and Gurminder, for being with us. Thank you uh, for your time and engaging uh, and uh, uh, generous contribution. And thanks to the audience for being with us today and your very good and uh, challenging questions. Uh, so I want to repeat that the video will be available uh, tomorrow. Um, I want to also thank uh, the ACES management team, uh, Lisa uh, Saris and Heis van der Starre for their uh, help uh, since the, uh, the first time we introduced them uh, with this idea. Uh, so I want to also make a small announcement about our next panel, which will be next Wednesday, uh, June the 24th. The title is Who Gets to Speak? The Exclusion of Voices in Academia and uh, Society. It will be from 3 to uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. It will be moderated by the co-convener of this online series, Tasnim Anwar. And we have, again, two uh, distinguished speakers who have confirmed. Uh, Professor Robbie Shilliam from John Hopkins University and Dr. Nivi Manchanda from Queen Mary University of London. Please do not forget, forget to register for uh, next, week, next week's event if you haven't done so. And uh, please consider also subscribing to our newsletter uh, to be updated not only about the event, uh, but also we have some suggested readings uh, for each of uh, the panels we organize. Um, so we very much hope to welcome many of you uh, in our upcoming events. Uh, please send also us some feedback uh, for us to improve uh, our, uh, our uh, upcoming panels. Um, thank you again. Uh, take care and I wish you a wonderful evening. <laughs>